All right. Thank you very much. And I thank everyone for coming. I thank Kari for inviting me. Um, and of course, you, he has, I have been introduced. So again, I would just mention, of course, that my research and teaching specialties are in U.S. foreign relations and particularly U.S. relations with Latin America. So of course, that leaves a question of why am I talking about the modern American woman? But we'll get to that in a second. Um, I'm here, of course, uh, working with Fulbright and teaching a class of, with Fulbright, of which we have 40 very, very bright university graduates. And they are studying American history with me, modern American history. And they are also studying modern American foreign policy with Professor John Eikenberry of Princeton. Uh, so that is why I'm here. And, and since he is doing foreign policy, I'm sort of doing modern American domestic history which one, of course, one topic is, of course, the, the role and status of women in American society. Now, uh, I'm, I'm going to mention that in our program, there are 22 women in the program, uh, the Fulbright program, who are 22 Argentine women who are graduates of uh, very fine universities and they're incredibly intelligent. Um, their ages are between 23 and 29. And so I gained a good deal of insight discussing with them and comparing with them the role and status of women in Argentina with the role and status of young women in the United States. And so hopefully, and hopefully we can bring that into the discussion and conversation. So let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm not going to do something formal in terms of reading a paper to you. That what I'm going to briefly do is go over some legislative key pieces of legislation and then I'm going to go over some statistics that will all be up here on the board, uh, both social statistics and uh, political statistics, statistics on uh, economics, statistics on sports, statistics on politics. Um, my key thesis will be that basically there has been very, very significant, even revolutionary change in the United States. Um, in terms of um, the role and status of women. A significant amount of change, but clearly equality among men and women has not been achieved in the United States. So that would be my basic thesis. Now, here's what I hope will happen. Um, I hope that we have much, many questions and discussions. As I understand it, that normally this goes to about 7.45, perhaps 8 p.m. What I intend to do is only take about 40 minutes. Now that I have taught several times in Argentina, and I know that Argentines are not shy, so that I hope we will have much discussion. I hope that we can make comparisons between the US and Argentina and show where there are similarities and where there are differences. Uh, and so I hope that we have a good deal of discussion because in the end, I consider myself a teacher. So a teacher always strives for discussion and debate. And Argentina, I have taught in 21 countries. There is no better country for discussion and debate than Argentina. <laughs> that, you know, if I have taught, for example, in Finland. Finnish people are very shy. It is very difficult to get a discussion going. But here I believe we shall have a discussion. I am confident we will have a discussion. So let's look a little bit about um, what's important in terms of the law in terms of the United States. Well, the first thing I have up there, of course, is the right to vote. Women gained the right to vote in the United States in 1920. I was very surprised to find out that Argentine women did not gain the right to vote until 1947, which, which would be very late in the Western world. By and large, in much of the Western world, I think that in Chile, women gained the right to vote in the early 20th century, in several Latin American countries, certainly in England, certainly in the United States. But that obviously was a big change in the United States. Um, the next and, and most important thing was the passage by President Kennedy. And so from 1920 through the early 1960s, there's slow change in the United States. But by and large, women did not have strong legal backing and strong legal um, uh, rights. Uh, still, as late as the 1950s, 1960s, uh, women often could, did not have full legal rights in terms of property 
in terms of signing contracts, in terms of uh, access to bank money, etc., that often they were still perceived in a sort of dependent status. Now, in the midst of the 1960s, when there's a significant amount of change in the United States, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, the youth movement, the gay rights movement, so too, of course, the women's movement really becomes quite important in the 1960s. And one of the first steps was that President Kennedy made a pledge to uh, then uh, the widow of Franklin Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, that if she supported him, that he would uh, try to do something about the role and status of women in American society. So he passed, he got passed through Congress something called the Equal Pay Act of 1963. Now, this law, which is still on the books, states that men and women must be paid the same pay if they are working in the same job. Now, on one level, that seems to have reached equality. The problem, of course, is that men and women often work in different types of professions. So while the equal pay, while it is illegal to pay a woman less if both a man and the woman are teachers in a colloquio or high school, it's illegal to pay them that. Too often, of course, as in the 1960s, women never had a chance to become the rector or principal of the collegium. Or the most obvious uh, issue would be that through much of history, doctors were men and nurses were women. So did doctors and nurses, were they paid equally? Of course not. Of course not. Um, Perhaps some of you have been in a hospital. Who's more important to getting you back to health, the doctor or the nurse? Well, quite obviously, the nurse is far more important. But she was being paid quite a bit less. So while there is this Equal Pay Act, one of the problems that has always persisted is that men work in certain types of profession which are highly paid, and women tend to work in other professions which historically have been low paid. Nonetheless, that was a, a legislative achievement. The other legislative achievement of, of keynote here in the 1960s was something called Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. Now, Title VII says that women cannot be discriminated against in the workplace. It's a, just a passage in this law. It's a very ironic development. The Civil Rights Act was to end segregation and to protect the rights of African Americans. An opponent of the Civil Rights Act was trying to defeat it. He thought he would put in what we would call a poison pill. That is to say, he added this little passage saying the law should also, we should also not discriminate against women. He thought for sure no one would ever pass a piece of legislation that gave equality both to African Americans and to women. Though well, to his great surprise, the bill passed, and so we have this particular piece of legislation. This remains, 51 years later, the basic law that, that protects the rights of women, particularly in work, in that if you feel as a woman you have been denied a promotion because you're a woman, if you feel that somehow or other you're being denied hiring or whatever because you're a woman, you would use this piece of legislation to um, uh, go to the courts and get rectification. Okay. Now, the next one is really important and probably strangely has had more, more um, impact. This is called Title IX of the Higher Education Act. Okay. Now this is a simple piece of legislation. This again is just Title IX being just a passage stating that there has to be equality in higher education for men or, and women. He was intended, I think, to say, stop steering women into home economics or nursing or teaching. Open up physics, science, engineering, technology to women. But the big impact of Title IX has been in sports. Title IX says, because we in the United States tend not to have Indian clubs, we tend to run our amateur sports via universities. And so universities were forced to create equal sports facilities for women as well as, you know, equal to that of men.
this has had an incredible impact because U.S. women are the greatest sportswomen in the world. After all, who won the Mundial? For women, it's the U.S. <coughs> I'm very diplomatic, and so I will not tell you what has happened when the Argentine women have played the American women in football. But if someone wants to ask, I will tell you what the scores have been. It's not many pretty sort of thing. Uh, this has been a very, very profound, uh, has had a very, very profound impact in the United States, and it tends to then spread to other types of areas that, that women's sports heroes become quite prominent in American life. Now, one or two other things that we should mention here. Um, Roe versus Wade. Roe versus Wade, of course, is a Supreme Court ruling in 1973 that permits abortion in the United States. It remains, 42 years later, very, very controversial. But nonetheless, it remains the law of the land. Uh, Roe versus Wade, which is really does come out of this kind of ferment here of the 1960s in terms of, of equality and rights for women, basically states that in the US, a woman has access to an abortion during the first trimester during the first three months. During the second three months, perhaps so, perhaps not. The question of when does life begin? The third trimester, um, almost certainly not, except in exceptional cases such as the life of the mother. Now obviously this bill and abortion remains in 2015, will be in 2016, an issue in the presidential election. Essentially the two political parties divide. Republicans oppose Roe versus Wade, Democrats support it. You can't run to be the Republican candidate for president unless you are against Roe versus Wade. You cannot run as the Democratic candidate unless you are in favor of Roe versus Wade. But I will tell you, that despite all the sound and fury, that basically about 59, 60% of Americans have always supported Roe versus Wade, and it remains the law of the land. And I see it not changing in any way. Now, two or three other things here that I want to mention that are legislative achievements that have some significance. In 1993, and I'll come back particularly to this one because I think it's important because it's so weak, the uh, Clinton administration passed something called the Family Leave Act. This gives a woman who has just given, child, given, given birth to a child or is in the last stages of pregnancy gives her up to three months or 12 weeks to take off from her job and to stay at home either during the last part of the pregnancy or with the newborn. And according to the law, she can return to her job. However, there is no money in this. There is no funding. As you perhaps know, in Nordic countries, in Finland, Sweden, Denmark, um, Norway, Family leave is often two to three years, where you can, if you are a new mom, you can leave your job for a couple of years, and the state pays you the money that you had been earning, plus you can go then go back to your job. They also have a, a part of their law, and sometimes insist, that if a woman leaves her job for two years or so, that her partner or husband must also leave at some point for another year. This is to make it sure that companies continue to hire women because they might say something, well, you're going to get pregnant and therefore um, uh, I'm not going to hire you. So now they're also insisting that men take time off. Now I think, I'll come back to this because I think the fact that this is a very weak family leave law leads to inequality in the United States. Finally, there are a couple of other things that I want to mention here that are of significance. The first piece of legislation that President Obama signed was called the Lilly Ledbetter Act. Lilly Ledbetter was a person, a woman who found out that for 40 years they had the company she had been working in was not honoring the Equal Pay Act that she had been being paid less wages for um, the same work that she was doing that men were doing. But after finding that this had been going on for decades, she just kind of finally found out they're discriminating against me. So then she went using Title 
Title uh, Seven of, of the Civil Rights Act tried to sue. But then they said, okay, you can sue, but only since the time you knew that you were being discriminated against, not the past 30 years. So President Obama's first piece of legislation was to rectify this. And so now, if you can prove you have been discriminated against in the workforce over a long period of time, you will get all of your pay back. That is now the U.S. law. One other thing, you can see it as, a, as an achievement or whatever, but since 2013, uh, U.S. women are allowed to be in military combat. At the present time of U.S. military forces, about 20% of U.S. military forces uh, are female, are women. And of course, actually during both Afghanistan and Iraq, there were many women who were actually in combat in some form or other, and there are many uh, notable cases. There is a congresswoman from Illinois who plans to run for Barack Obama's seat in the U.S. Senate in 2016, who was a helicopter pilot, and she lost both of her legs. And she's a, she's a very famous woman in the United States, a very brave woman, uh, and she's likely to be elected senator from, uh, from Illinois. But in any case, this is perceived as a step forward in terms of women in combat. Now, a big failure that never happened in the United States was the, um, was the addition to the U.S. Constitution of the Equal, uh, Equal Rights Amendment. The Equal Rights Amendment was a very simple statement saying that discrimination based on sex is illegal. Discrimination against women is illegal. A very simple statement. In order to amend the U.S. Constitution, you need uh, 38 states or three quarters of the states to pass passed this particular uh, amendment. It never got more than 35. It fell three states short. And I do not think even in 2015 you could get more than, you could get that 38. Maybe you could, maybe you could not. So this was a major failure. Now, one final thing that I want to mention, you know, the kind of elephant in the room that I have not mentioned. Ultimately, more important than all of this legislation, more important than the Equal Pay Act, more important than Title IX of the Higher Education Act, is the development of oral contraceptives. You know, as an historian, I do not see how you, how you can any way overestimate the revolutionary impact of oral contraceptives. Um, I would say that in our, you know, in our kind of historical memory, that the development of antibiotics penicillin is probably the most important medical development. It's increased life expectancy. The, the widespread use of, and, you know, the average person in the Western world lived to the age of 50 in 1900. Now the average person lives to 77, 78, 79, depending on the country. Um, that was a revolutionary medical development. I cannot, I would just rank number two oral contraceptives. Oral contraceptives have revolutionized relations between men and women, and have uh, really been the underpinning, I think, of the women's movement. Because oral contraceptives gave young women the ability to control their own destiny. Um, at the present time in the United States, 76% of all women who are in the childbearing age use oral contraceptives. In Argentina, it is 78%. How do I know this? Well, I went to the CIA, a world fact book, and the CIA seems to know everything, including how many Argentine women are using oral contraceptives. How they know that, I do not know, but they seem to know it. And, you know, I, you know while being, you know, being a little bit facetious here, I really don't think you can underestimate the impact of oral contraceptives. It, have, it has revolutionized family life, it has revolutionized uh, the relationships between men and women, is revolutionized the professional careers of young women. Um, it's an entirely uh, a different world because of oral contraceptives. Now, having said that, let's look and see where, wh what are some of the changes. Okay. Social statistics on women in the United States. Again, Thank you, CIA, that gives me many of these statistics. 
Life expectancy in the United States today for men is 77, for women is 82. Okay. Now, in human history, traditionally men lived longer than women. It's only been in the 20th century that women have begun to outlive men, mainly because women are having fewer children. You know, if you were having in the 19th century, 18th century, 17th century, whatever, five to 10 children, you are risking your life. So traditionally, throughout all of human history, um, uh, men, men live longer than women. But in most of the developed world, Europe, Latin America, the United States, there's about a five-year difference. Uh, there is about a five-year difference in Argentina. Uh, Argentines live about a year and a half to two years less than people in the U.S. on average. And that's because I've been scolding some of my students in the Fulbright uh, program because still Argentines smoke a little too much. And smoking is keeping this, keeping this. Okay. All right, marrying age. The average marrying age now is, it keeps going up every year. It's 29 for men and 27 for women. Of my 22 Argentine women, 29 to 23, not one is married. Not one. Now, these are all young professional women. Now, for college age, the median marrying age for uh, uh, women in the United States, for those who have college educations, law degrees, medical degrees, graduate school degrees, professional degrees, is basically now 30, um, um, 30 years of age. Uh, many of the Argentine women were very happy to hear because I had a couple who were 29 and they, they were a little antsy that they're not married. But they said they had boyfriends, or whatever. Um, but the basic thing now in the United States is that most college educated women marry between the ages of 30 and 40. Now, of course, this is quite profound in a variety of ways. That most of these young women in the United States or in Argentina are seeking to develop their professional life. But also, clearly, it means that the size of your family is going to be sm much smaller, simply because you have delayed the childbearing years. You haven't delayed sex because there are oral contraceptives. Now, some things have not changed. Divorce rates. In the United States, 41% of people divorce who've been married once. <clears throat> I would tell you that college educated women who delay marriage till after the age of 30 are less likely to divorce. If you marry a second time, there's a 60% chance that your marriage will end in divorce. As it was once said, second marriages, third marriages, fourth marriages are triumphs of hope over experience. The, if you marry a third time, it's 73%. If you get into, if you remember Elizabeth Taylor, who was a serial marrier, or Zsa Zsa Gabor, you know, when you get up to sixth or seventh marriage, you know, an hour or two at last, and then it's gone, or whatever. Okay. Inevitably, fertility has gone down in the United States. The United States population is growing very, very rapidly, but it's mainly growing through immigration now. The United States is at ZPG, meaning at 2.606 children per family which is zero population growth. Now, the U.S. is growing by two and a half million people a year, but that's mainly through immigration and because fertility rates among first-generation immigrants are, a bit, are somewhat higher. Uh, College-educated women, they on average are having one and a half children. One child and then, of course, one very small child or something to that effect. So, I mean, but that's quite obvious if you delay marrying age, uh, then the size of families declines. One of the reasons that the United States is very pro-immigration and we give one million green cards a year legally is because we need to increase the size of the U.S. population because it's not through replacement value. I think Argentina's uh, fertility rate has come down very, very dramatically. Uh, it's about 2.3. 
I believe that Brazil is at zero population growth. Uh, Mexico has come down quite rapidly, down into 2.3, 2.4 children per family. Uh, the other large country in, in the hemisphere, um, uh, Colombia is down to 2.3, 2.4, and Canada, as you might suspect, is also around the U.S. Uh, level. Births. 59% of all births are, are by uh, married women. But 52% of births by women under 30 are to unmarried women. It seems to be a phenomenon that non-college educated women uh, frequently are having children without marriage. And I would tell you that there is a new phenomenon in the United States where large numbers of women, both college educated and non-college women, are saying, I want to have a baby, but I don't care if I'm married. And that's, you know, that's very much featured in the media and TV, et cetera. And I think this is a, a phenomenon that first started in Europe, of women having children but not really caring if they were married. Uh, and has spread to the United States and I think is spreading uh, throughout Latin America also. A couple other statistics that I want to go over here um, in terms of this issue of abortion. Uh, there are approximately 1.2 million abortions a year in the United States. Now that has come down quite dramatically because it, literally there are fewer pregnancies in the United States. Um, 90% of them are in the first trimester, during the first three months of pregnancy. Who is the typical person who has an abortion? 16 years, 17 years of age, 18, 19, 20. Very, very young women are those who tend to have abortions. Virtually all abortions are by women under 24, with sort of unwanted pregnancy. Now finally, before I go to the other statistics, I did add one because the students told me this was a big issue in the United States, in Argentina, the issue of sexual violence. Here there's been enormous progress made. Domestic violence is down 50% since 1993. Now this was a law sponsored by the present Vice President Joseph Biden called uh, the Violence Against Women Act that's been in, in, in effect now for 22 years. It has brought about an enormous cultural change. Republicans and Democrats argue bitterly, endlessly over abortion. But Republicans and Democrats, conservatives and liberals, would thoroughly agree on this new law. And there has been an incredible cultural change. Um, domestic, you know, a, wife, a man does not have the right to beat, beat up his wife. It is now considered not only a public issue, but a, an issue that will be punished with extremely severe penalties. It is a, the cultural norm. If you could put, you could put, uh, I don't know, you could put Barack Obama and Jeb Bush on the same jury, and if they heard that a man had had sex with his wife against her will. They consider that rape, and they would, they would send that man to jail for 30 years. Um, as you perhaps know, it's been a big issue in the United States. The comedian, the famous actor, Bill Cosby, was using drugs to uh, seduce women, having them pass out. And so President Obama was asked about that, and he gave a very, very short but powerful statement. He stated that while well, he didn't want to address the particular issue per se because he is the chief executive officer and so therefore did not want to become legally involved, but he said any man who gives drugs to a woman to seduce her is a rapist and that rape was committed here. Um, also, in, since 1993, uh, with, with the uh, Violence Against Women Act, sexual assault is down by 70%, as reported by the FBI, as reported by a variety of legal authorities. There has been an incredible change in the United States. Now, I, I praised or appointed to family leave in like Finland, Denmark, Norway, but in those countries where they don't have strong laws, violence within the family is still a very big problem, a very big problem. But not only do we have laws, 
but the law seemed to have affected a cultural change, which is clearly related to the women's movement in the United States. And at least as reported by various legal authorities in the United States, there has been an incredible and dramatic decline in sexual violence against women. Apparently, Bill Cosby did not get the memorandum. Mm -hmm. uh, but there has been a really big decline. Now, let's just go to a couple of other sorts of things here. Good. Okay, where are some other big changes where there have been no changes? Basically, men and women in the United States finish high school, finish colloquio at about the same rate. But then when you go into higher education, in my field, there has been a total and complete revolution. 56 to 58 percent of initial degrees are now earned by women. It's heading towards 60 percent. Most universities and colleges actually try to get a 50-50 split in entering students. But in terms of graduation rates, it's now heading towards 60%. There has, I went to an all-male college in the 1960s. There were 800, it was a small all-male college. There were 800 men. And I never took a course from a female professor, a woman professor. There were no women professors. Now, it's a co-educational college with 1,700, far more women. The president of the college is a woman, and my daughter went to the college. This is just revolutionary. I never could have imagined that my daughter could go to this college that I, that I went to. I never could have imagined I, had, well, I would have a daughter, but certainly I didn't imagine I would have a daughter that went to this college who is headed by a woman. And it's continuing beyond the bachelor degree. 57 to 61 percent of master's degrees are now being earned by women. And for the first time, beginning in 2010, the majority of PhDs were being granted to women. This is an incredible revolution in higher education. Incredible revolution. I mean, in the 1950s, the basic norm was a woman went to college for two years and then married a graduating man and got her MRS degree her Mrs. degree, that she would get a good catch, that this good catch would provide, provide for her while she stayed at home with the children. Um, most of the time now, when I ask my young undergraduates in 1920, they tell me that they're, ne ne they're never even going to get married, that they have no desire or interest in this, that they're very vocation-oriented and professional-oriented. Now, there are some lacking here in terms of what we call the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, math, women are still underrepresented. There are a variety of programs to encourage young girls in the United States to major in the sciences, to major in math, to major in computer science. But still, that the science part of U.S. higher education tends to still be male dominated. But in terms of medical school graduates, law school graduates, it's pretty much equal now, pretty much equal. Now, overall, there are still more male doctors, but it will equal out over time. Uh, in addition, um, um, in some schools, like veterinary schools, women are 80% of veterinarians, vet, veterinarians with animals. Uh, really quite amazing. And in some schools of education, social work, etc., women are, 80, are getting 80% of the <coughs> professional degrees. Now, does this matter? Yeah, I think it does. Because traditionally, let's say in medical school, in our top medical schools like say Johns Hopkins or near where I live in Dallas, Texas Southwestern Medical, they do scientific research, medical research. There are federal grants given to them to do medical research, scientific research. Traditionally, money might go for cardiovascular problems. Let's do research on cardiovascular problems. Why? Because guys have heart attacks. <laughs> Not enough money was dedicated to breast cancer. But when you have women rising to the presidencies of these major medical organizations, which is inevitable, given the way the degrees are going, 
then inevitably more money will be shifted towards dealing with things that women are, are concerned about, such as breast cancer and other types of women's issues. When you look at the research, the medical research and the great advances have all been towards men, male diseases. More money for prostate cancer, for research on prostate cancer, as opposed to vaginal cancer. Now, in terms of work. Some progress, but not equality. Women today earn 77% of what men earn in the United States. Now that's up from in the 1960s when it was 63%, or 63 cents to the dollar, and now 77 cents to the dollar. Younger women are much closer, who are not clearly better educated. They earn about 93% of what men earn. Women today constitute <coughs> approximately 50% of the workforce. And women today hold approximately 35% of the professional degrees, although that clearly is going to go to 50 and then beyond 50 over the next 20 to 40 years, simply because of who's graduating from college. Now, the question, of course, it seems to me is that you would ask is, well, if there has been this progress in higher education, progress in professional degrees, why does there continue to be this disparity between men and women in terms of earning? It seems to me there's two basic issues here that one will have to think about. One is that women are still concentrated in professions that have historically received low wages. Administrative, secretarial, nursing, uh, primary school education, etc that society is deemed to be low paying as opposed to plumbers or mechanics or auto mechanics or uh, electricians, etc. That would be one, again, where women tend to be in positions that historically have been lowly paid because they're female positions. The second, I think, for particularly for professional women, which I found the young Argentine women were very worried about, they all wanted to be married, they all had boyfriends, they all intended to be married, but they didn't know what they were going to do when they had a full-time job and profession and had children. What about family leave? This is in the United States, the big issue, that there is a very weak family leave. Who takes care of the children? How do you work and take care of the children? So I think that tends to, tends to part explain why there is, is there can continue disparity. The lack of family leave combined with kind of sex stereotyping of professions. Now, politics. The United States is way behind the rest of the world. As I, as I know in Argentina, of course, you have somewhat of a quota system that would uh, ensure that a certain number of women are elected to federal offices as well as state offices. There are many other countries, the Nordic countries now have sort of quota systems ensuring that a certain percentage of women, and I believe in some Nordic countries now, the majority of legislators are female, are women. We have 100 senators, two senators per state, and then 435 people in the House of Representatives. So we're total in Washington of 535. Only 104 are women, or about 17, 18 percent. Of the 50 governors of states, only six are women, 20%. Now, why is this so? Well, traditionally, politics was male-dominated. We don't have any quota system. But to run for office, you need access to money, given that, that campaigns in the United States are privately financed. Women do not have the same access to money as men. And, of course, no woman has served as president of the United States yet. Yeah, but no one, and of course only two women ever ran on the national ticket, uh, Geraldine Ferraro in 1984 and Sarah Palin in 2008. In both of those cases, the man was so far behind and desperate, just reached, sought a woman just to make things different. But in both cases, the candidates chose a woman who was not qualified to be president of the United States. So in politics, there's been very, very, you know, compared to the rest of the Western world, whether Latin America, Canada, or Europe, the United States is way, way behind in terms of political power. 
despite some of these other types of changes and some of these laws. Um, in sports, Title IX has really worked its magic. The United States in the 2012 Olympics finished number one ahead of China. We won 104 medals, 46 of which were gold, go team. Thank God for women. U.S. women won 58 of the medals, 56, 57 percent, and they won 29 of the gold medals, well over half. Uh, so Title IX has, trans, you know, has transformed the United States into a, into a sports powerhouse for women, for women. You might be surprised in terms of football that it actually is the most popular sport in the United States. I tell you, I know it's going to be a terrible day for you, but one day the men are going to win Mundial. One day the U.S. men are going to win Mundial. And I know that life will end in both Europe and Latin America when that happens, but it's going to happen because so many young people are playing football in the United States. But almost as many women are playing football as young men. I mean, this is the most popular sport in the United States. People tend to think it might be American football or baseball or basketball. Actually, more young people are playing football, soccer, what we call soccer, than any other sport. And it's almost equal numbers of men and women. And again, as I said, the U.S. women's uh, national team won the World Cup in 2015 in very, very convincing fashion. Even if we look, interestingly, even if we look at the, some of the teams, Mexico's team, Colombia's team, particularly Colombia's team did quite well. Most of their uh, women had actually, were actually attending U.S. colleges, where they were playing football in the U.S. colleges and universities. Um, so, this is pretty much where I'll leave it here, and hopefully, you know, we've got to the 45 minutes or so that I thought I would talk and show you some of the statistics, some of the changes, significant changes, even revolutionary changes in the role and status of women in society, including uh, in, in Western society, including the United States. Enormous changes, but equality, no. Equality, no. Uh, and I think probably the two big issues are the question of family leave and uh, the stereotyping of particular types of jobs. So I am ready for the questions.